think I'm beginning to finally feel okay. I met someone named Jesus just, well, just the other day. John doesn't also advertise as a great place to meet someone. Um, possibly a future life mate. So that's, that's something else, John, you could put in a brochure. I'm sure that would be reassuring to the parents. Uh, send your child down here, we'll get them married off before the summer's over. <laughs> Pastor Day and Grace Calvary do great weddings, so you send them our way. <laughs> uh, uh, see, that's, that's, that's why they have me at the end of the summer because I would probably stir the pot too much. I stick my foot in my mouth all the time, so it's just the way it is. Hey, we've been talking about survival. And our first day, we started off with a bang talking about suffering, but in a really real sense, we all do suffer in life, no matter what our age is. And the second day, we looked at surviving in our crazy world. And yesterday, we kind of talked about suffering and working through relationships with people and with failure, and uh, today, survival, I kind of want to get at the subject of those who are not surviving, or those who are at risk of surviving, and let me just say it this way, we, we may have more than one person in this room who is already at high risk of not suffering because of all the things that are going on in our world today, and so we want to uh, seek the Lord's faith. Let me just say it's been a real privilege and honor to be here this week. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much for the many kind compliments and words of encouragement I've received. Just after lunch today, if you want to remember to pray for us, uh, my wife Lyndon has gotten her oncologist appointment with Sloan Kettering. That just all happened this week. And so we're going to be heading up there right after, well, right around lunchtime, so thank you so much for praying for us for that regard as well. Just a brief prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, again for your word. We thank you for the spirit of this word, and we ask now, Lord, that by thy spirit you would anoint this time in our teaching, and guide and direct in all things, and Lord, we just thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy, one of my favorite books in the Bible is actually where I'm going to go next at Grace Calvary as I'm wrapping up another series. In 2 Timothy, which many believe was perhaps the last of Paul's letters, he writes in chapter 1, verse 15. We're going to be looking at more than just that one verse, but first, just down in verse 15, he writes this. Now just remember, this is a man who's had a rather effective ministry. He's been to probably more towns and cities than you could count, and probably has known at this point in his life thousands of people, and perhaps having even seen hundreds if not thousands of people come to faith in the Lord Jesus. And so you would think now at this point in his life, it's sort of like a, a pinnacle, a mountaintop. After all, he has all this good labors to look back upon. But then he writes this in verse 15. You are aware of the fact that all who are in Asia, now Asia would have typically taken in that whole region of Turkey and sweeping over in that direction. You're probably familiar with Asia Minor. All who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phagellus and Hermogenes. When he writes that, I, I wonder what emotion, because the Bible doesn't always tell us, does it, what the emotion was of the person who was speaking or writing at the time. I wonder, was, was he angry about this? Was he hurt? I imagine he was hurt. I imagine he was probably quite disappointed to, to say this. It, I know how that can sting, and you probably do as well. Well, now, on this day... One of my thoughts this last year has been affected by something in my own life. 
And that is, I have a very close friend who we met in Ireland. He was just in high school at the time. He loved the Lord. He was a witness for the Lord Jesus among his classmates. They had a, a Christian union, uh, and he would invite me to come out to his public high school, what well, was a Protestant school, and speak at his Christian union. Uh, Sam was a, an, a great evangelist in many ways. He, he would go out with us knocking on doors and would stand on street corners in his own town and other towns letting people know that he was a follower of the Lord Jesus. I remember one of the stories about him was that one time he was witnessing on a Saturday night and a guy walked up and punched him in the head simply because he was witnessing for the Lord Jesus. Well, as he got older, he met Marika, who was from Finland, and she too was a believer, and they got married, and then decided to move over to Finland, and that's where they went. And so I think for more than a decade or so, they've been there, and they have three children now. And they've even visited us at least once here in the States, and we've maintained a relationship with them. But this last year, we received a letter from Sam. And in this email, he was writing to us and to those in his circle of friends to tell all of us that he no longer considered himself to be a Christian and that he wasn't even sure whether or not God exists. That, that broke our hearts, because now this was not just someone that we've heard about. This is someone that we love. This is someone that we would consider part of our extended family. Not long ago, a father who had adopted a young man, raised him in his own family, came up to me after a service in the summertime and said to me, Pastor Dan, that son of mine now tells me that he no longer believes in God. One of my church elders, a very close friend of mine, had a similar experience. He was driving his son to college, and he says he can still remember the exact place and driving him over to school. And his son looked over at him and says, Dad, I just want you to know something before I start college. What's that? He says, I just want you to know I don't believe in God anymore. It's, it's sad. It's, it's horrible. It's heart-wrenching. And I don't judge parents who may be going through or have gone through that experience, especially because it may be some of you in this room. I would wish this upon no one. I, I truly feel that way. And yet, we are living in a season at risk. We truly are. And I don't know how you look at prophetic things in Scripture, but the Bible even speaks of a day when there will be a great falling away. And you have to wonder what's going on right now, because we are witnessing, ladies and gentlemen, not a revival in evangelicalism, but we are witnessing a generation of, shall I say it this way, patch the pirate kids who are no longer walking with Christ let alone even believing in God. I think I mentioned earlier in the week that beyond the religion of Islam by birth rate in terms of how fast it grows, that the fastest growing religion in the world right now is no religion at all. And as they are taking statistics here in the United States, the percentages are rapidly changing within our own country of people now who are identifying with no religion. That is the fastest growing percentage. And with all these things going on, I've been thinking over this last half a year after this letter I received from Sam, and by the way, I continue to be in correspondence with him. We still have a relationship. Uh, we're still loving on him. 
and hoping and praying that a place will come when he'll turn back to the Lord. I've been thinking a lot about why does this happen? Especially if you're a parent, you're going to ask that question. How did that happen? I know, for example, that one way it can happen is when the Bible itself is attacked. And the Bible has been attacked, is still being attacked, and will be attacked in the future. Not just in in public academia, but sometimes even in wider Christian circles. There is a man who started out his education at Moody Bible Institute, went on to Wheaton College. From there, he went to Princeton University, gathering all of his degrees from bachelor's right up through master's and his doctorate. Pastored a small Baptist church just outside of downtown Princeton, a little church, Linda, by the way, my wife, where your grandmother used to attend. His name is Bart Earlman. He is now professor at Chapel Hill in North Carolina and has effectively dedicated the most recent decades of his life driving in the polar opposite direction, doing whatever he can to try to convince every generation, the next generation that shows up in his classroom that you cannot possibly believe the Bible because it's full of hundreds of thousands of errors. Well, now, the many things he says that aren't exactly entirely true, but that's the picture that he would paint. And he's appeared in many debates uh, opposing those that would stand on the side of Scripture. And so, of course, some of our young people who are academically bent have been influenced and affected by people like this. I'd also say, too, that evolutionary theory is not losing ground, not at least in our wider culture. If I would say anything, I think that it's gaining ground, and I hear more and more people speak of it in terms of fact. We have a major issue, and I don't know where you stand on this, but what do you do with the Bible when it says that God created Adam and Eve? And there's so many other things. Well, see, it's issues like this that can begin to shake up young minds. The other day I was talking to a mother whose son works for the Family Research Council in Washington, D.C., and I was telling her about my own personal research. She's writing a book. And I was asking her, I said, why do you think that there's this trend which I'm seeing? Folks, I'm seeing and I have more and more families and within our own church and in wider circles telling me stories, examples of how their children too have, and they can't believe it that that their child is now where they are. And as we were talking about it, I told her I landed upon an old philosophical term that also summarizes up why many, many in this next generation are turning away from God. It's the word hedonism. Hedonism means the love of pleasure versus pain. Many have walked away from their faith, not for just academic reasons, but simply because of the pleasures of sin when it comes right down to it. After all, you have your truth and I have my truth. And why should I interfere with someone else's pleasure? And why can't I have my own? See, things really are changing, aren't they? As a young woman told me years ago who was in love and living with an older man and her parents were concerned and they asked me if if I would talk to her about this, and so I did, and I said, don't you know what you're doing is wrong? And she said to me, it can't be. Why? Because I love him. That's why. Well, you know, that's really a reflection of the pleasure principle. 
as love can be spun to mean all sorts of things. I've often wondered, why did Phil Jealous and Hermogenes and all who are in Asia, why did Paul feel like they had turned away from him? I'd like to read the wider context now, if I can, beginning with verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve with a clear conscience, the way my forefathers did, as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day, longing to see you, even as I recall your tears, so that I may be filled with joy, for I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm sure it's in you as well. And for this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in the suffering for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which he has granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher, and for this reason I also suffer these things. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Retain the standard of sound words which you heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus, and guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. Beloved, beyond Paul's greeting in verses 1 and 2, there's something that we all need to be doing in order to more than survive, but to thrive. Because as difficult times come, and I sincerely believe that even more difficult times are coming, but it's not the time to stop living. Not at all. In fact, I wouldn't tell everyone, especially cautioning our younger people, don't put your life on hold. But verses 3 and 4 would remind me that as Paul prayed for Timothy, that's what we really need to be doing, is praying in earnest for the next generation. You know, when I stand up here and I'm 60 years old, someone who's much younger could be in this say, oh, there they go again, some old guy picking on our generation. And it's sort of funny because I remember when I was the younger generation, <laughs> thinking it's of some older guy picking on my generation. But the truth is, Paul prayed in earnest, night and day, constantly prayed and remembered Timothy before the Lord. Jesus has not returned yet, folks. He may tarry who knows how much longer. But right now, we need to pray for this next generation. As Within this next month, I'll have four grandsons representing that generation. And I can't be a Debbie Downer about it. Instead, my prayer is that they will rise up and stand up against the tide of this world and take a strong stand on the word of God and for Jesus Christ and will be a witness to their day. And who knows what revival God may bring. Well, in case you don't know, Beth, that was my first principle. Pray for this next generation. My second principle is I think that family still matters. I think that needs to be said in the days that we're living in where oftentimes government would suggest, if not outright, say that they could do things better. But I don't believe that at all. I believe as parents, no matter what the ages of your children are, 
whether they still be at home and young or little or older and grown up, married and going away, you still have an opportunity to influence them until either they go home or you go home to be with the Lord. Why do I say that? Look at the impact, verse 5. As Timothy, in his own life, Paul says, Why, you had Eunice, your mother, and your grandmother, Lois. Of course, his father isn't mentioned. There's ideas perhaps his father didn't know the Lord. We really don't know. But in all these things, he points to these two dear women in Timothy's life, and he says, Look what impact, influence they had on your life. And for some of us, at becoming grandparents, that's our next and our new calling, is to that generation. My wife was telling me the other day that one of our adult children asked her, why did we, when they were growing up, they, this, they asked, well, why, why did we in our home limit the music that was listened to primarily to Christian music? Why, why, did, we, why did we do that? And of course, I, I, I can kind of see behind the question is, you know, it's sort of like, uh, you know, it, wasn't that kind of legalistic? It, if I'll just stay with me here for a moment on this. But it, in fact, what the reality really was, in raising our kids, Linda and I chose to give up many, what we felt were liberties for the sake of our children. We felt that there wasn't necessarily anything wrong with maybe listening to music that wasn't Christian, like an orchestra or whatever. You know, there's all sorts of music we can listen to, wonderful music. And yet we, we gave, we, we gave, and that's what we wanted to say. We wanted to say, to our, well, if you want to know the truth, we sacrifice for you, for your benefit. Why do I mention this? Because family does matter as Timothy's family did matter. Not long ago, I need to be careful, I don't want to mention names, but I became aware of a, a Christian husband and wife, their daughter in her 20s, engaged. And, and they decided that because their daughter didn't claim to know Jesus and her boyfriend didn't claim to know Jesus, that in order to help them to get a house after they were married, that it would be okay for them to live together in their home. Now, I don't know how you work that out in your own lives, but it troubled me because it just reminded me once again of how parents are often afraid to stand their ground. Typically, a rebellious adult child will do this, I'll never talk to you again, mom and dad, if you don't capitulate to my sin. And so mom or dad who's afraid of losing the relationship bends just however much. I'm telling you, that's not the way to go. Because if your child decides to walk away and not have a relationship, that, it doesn't mean that you have ever said, and you can even say to them, I'm not the one driving you away. I want to have a relationship with you, but you have to understand, you can't expect me to compromise on things that we raised you to believe. That's tough but that's remaining being a witness in the life of your child. It truly is. Third principle in verses 6 and 7, we absolutely need godly mentors who will love on care and invest in the next generation to keep their eyes on Jesus. That's what places like Harvey Cedars Bible Conference, that's what they're doing, giving many of these young people, there's a there's a picture, a little flyer of a Aaron Mulberry. He's got a little goatee, no hair now. He's pastoring, I understand, I think South Dakota. What an impact he had on our first son's life. 
first person he met that, that loved on him when he came to Harvey Cedars Bible Conference. That's what we need to be doing. And Paul here says, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, verse 6, which, we, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Paul's saying, I was there. I was there. And you're not to have a spirit of fear. Young person, you're walking out into the world. You're not to have a spirit of fear. You are not to cower, but you are to stand tall and firm in your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And those of us who are older need to stand behind these young people and encourage and cheer them on. I think of Colin and Steve and Glenn and Kieran and David and Chad and Casey and Brad and Nate. These are all names of young men that my life has touched. It may be a neighbor boy that you drive to youth group. He's not a part of your family, but you're convinced that God would have you reach across to that family. Paul writes here in verses 8 through 11, Therefore, don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Young people, especially in this room, if you're off in university, don't be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. And Paul says, Or of me as prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. I had a young man come up to me yesterday and he was asking me about ministry. And he was telling me he was preparing for ministry. And so I spent the next half hour trying in my own way to convince him not to be in ministry. What? Well, he started out by telling me that he was a sensitive individual. And so I told him, so am I. And so, and that's how my life began. And then, then people just put me through the meat grinder. And I couldn't take it. It was hard. It hurt. And I wanted him to know that that was probably going to happen to him too. We do so much to prepare people to be in the military and to go to war. And we, we seem to forget that preparing a man for a pastoral ministry is more than just equipping him in the Bible and theology, but actually toughening him up for the onslaught of stuff and nonsense and stupidity and meanness, horrible things that will happen. That guy one time dragged me into the men's room. Why did I have to go in the men's room? But hey, he dragged me into the men's room to try to convince me that I was going to lose the church if I didn't change. I'm still here. He went on to be with the Lord. Well, now. <laughs> Verses 8 through 11 remind me, as Harvey Cedars has been doing for years, fourth principle, encourage the next generation to become even more involved in ministry in the younger years of life. The, the sooner I think that you can get a young person involved in God's work, all the better. There must have been something about Timothy that Paul saw, the commendation that he received, that he was like, i got to have this guy come along and work with me. And so Paul had poured his life into him and this is what we need to do as well. There was not only a Mr. and Mrs. O in my wife's Linda's life, but there was also a Mr. and Mrs. C. And I, I wonder down here at Harvey Cedars, is that we, I, am I a, a Mr. S? I, I, you have to wonder how many have come through, and they have such a rich heritage of raising up people. I had to go over into the dish room, I just had to, and ask those young men about Hobart. And of course they told me that the washing machine had been changed, but was still known, I think, as Hobart. You know about Hobart, it, you, how many of you have never been here before and don't know about Hobart? Hobart, the washing machine, there's a tradition of the boys that they will go through the machine. 
Not with the director's knowledge, of course. <laughs> my greatest fear when my kids came here is I saw the, 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 the grinder in the sink, and I lectured my kids for like 10 minutes about how you do not put your hand in there when that switch is on. And I just, but that's me. Anyway, <laughs> encouraging our young people in ministry. In verses 12 through 14, a principle I drew from this was suffering, whatever comes our way, nevertheless, we must stand guard for our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul wrote, for this reason I suffer these things, but I'm not ashamed. Young people, especially moms and dads, I sure hope, friends, I hope you appreciate what I'm saying here. This is what we need. We need the generation to stand up and to say, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed to say that I have believed in the Lord Jesus, and I'm convinced that he's able to guard what I've entrusted to him until that day. And that's also, too, if we have children in our family that don't know the Lord Jesus, we can hold that out to them and say to them, and believe it with all our hearts because we know it. Let me tell you, daughter, son, Jesus has never failed me. He'll never fail you neither. Uh, either. And Paul says, guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure that's been entrusted to you. What we need are soldiers in God's house. What we need are people whose faith is greater than the fear of the virus. In some respects, the virus has exposed our weakness. And I don't mean physically, but I mean as a church, spiritually. The world will never understand unless those in authority also know the Lord themselves. But if they do not, they will never ever understand why for you as a Christian, worship with your congregation is so important to you. They will not understand why you will not just simply go along and lock and close the doors. Why wouldn't you do that? Because you and I are no longer citizens of this world but we are citizens of heaven. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. And we have a message, folks, don't we, that sets the captive free. We have a message that Christ Jesus, the very God-man, died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day in victory. And in that, I say, there is great victory. Now I'm going to invite, he doesn't know this, but I'm going to invite my buddy Joey, if you would come up here. Because Joey is the one who came up to me yesterday to talk to me about pastoral ministry. He's in his second year at Liberty University, is that right? And I've asked you to come up here, Joey, because I just want to lay hands on you. And I want the rest of you to stand with me. And as representative, Joey, of our young people in this room, and, and the generation that is coming and rising up, that we pray for them. If you want to even stretch out your hand. Father God, we pray for Joey, and we pray for our other young people in this room, Lord. We stand with them, that they would be strong and mighty in the faith, and not be ashamed in their generation to identify themselves with Jesus Christ as their Lord and Master, as their King of kings and Lord of lords. And we would pray, Lord God, that you would touch hearts, and I would pray along with parents who have children who don't know you yet, or who have children who aren't walking with you, Lord, that we will not give up, we will not give in, but we will continue to labor in our prayers against the enemy and against this world 
as we continue to claim them for Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank you again for this week and for the spiritual impact it's had upon all of us. And now, Father, I pray that you'll bless each and every person and every family represented here today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. God bless you, Joey. And folks, God bless all of you. Have a great day. I think I'm beginning to finally feel okay. I met someone named Jesus just, well, just the other day.